Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Ruzbe Parsi. I'm head of the uh, Middle East and North Africa program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. And we are organizing this together with our colleagues at the Global Politics and Security Program, in particular, the program coordinator, Sophie Berdund, who is sitting behind the screen, so to speak, in the control room, making sure that this works. This seminar is the first, or rather this discussion is the first of two, which is about the role of religion in foreign policy. How do, can we understand what role religion plays, whether it's a formal institutionalized one or one that emanates from societal groups and sentiments? Um, this is a very complicated topic, if you will. And in the second part, we will then also discuss India and Russia. And that part will take place on the 15th of April. In order to discuss what it is that we mean when we say religion and international politics and everything that goes on between them, uh, I have two very distinguished guests to help me disentangle all of this. First of all, I'd like to welcome Professor Elizabeth Shackman Hurd, who is joining us from Chicago. She's Professor of Politics and Religious Studies and the Crown Chair in Middle Eastern Studies at Northwestern University in Illinois. She holds the PhD. She holds a PhD in, from, in political science from Johns Hopkins University, and she has researched uh, numerous topics, including this one, which is the reason why she's joining us today. She has two books in particular, which I would like to mention. One is The Politics of Secularism in International Relations, and the second one is Beyond Religious Freedom, The New Global Politics of Religion. Then from Brussels, we are joined by Merita Bilde. Merita is a policy advisor at the European External Action Service of the European Union. She works on a number of issues, especially in the cross-section between religion and foreign policy. She has a long distinguished career as a diplomat, starting back in the mid 1990s, then moving on to the External Action Service and the European Union itself, uh, working for the high representative Javier Solana, among others. She's also the driving force behind the External Action Service Task Force on Religion and Culture and the EAS training courses on religion and foreign policy. That is the attempt to try to actually bring out this kind of knowledge and insight to those who have to practice foreign policy. She's also one of the co-founders of the Transatlantic Policy Network on Religion and Foreign Policy, which again also ties into what we're going to discuss because it is as much a question of how the EU and the United States see eye to eye or not on what religion is and what freedom of belief is and how they play out in foreign policy. Welcome to both of you. Let us begin with the complications. Um, Elizabeth, help me try and disentangle. Uh, when we talk about religion and when we talk about the international order, on the face of it, it seems like two fairly well delineated and easily defined phenomenon. Uh, but then when we start scratching that surface, it turns out it's much more complicated. Where should we start in trying to disentangle this? Should we start with a simple year, perhaps? Let's say 1648. What can we yes. say? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I, I think that there are a lot of different places we can start. Um, you could certainly start with the um, kind of mythological founding of our state system in 1648 or going back to the Peace of Augsburg in the, the prior century, if you wanted to do that. But either Augsburg or Westphalia, as the founding of the state system is often thought of as a foundational moment in which uh, shifts started to take place um, between religious and political authority. But in a way, what I would like to suggest provocatively, I think, rather than uh, trying to work ourselves chronologically through centuries of European history and then global history, um, would be to suggest very simply that religion and politics have never been separated and that we have always had religious aspects of politics and political aspects of religion, whether in its institutionalized form or other forms that it takes, it has a political aspect to it. So in a sense, what we need to do then is ask a different set of questions <clears throat> about our institutions, about our social realities, our political realities, our global political challenges that we're facing. 
we need to really rethink the questions that we're asking and try to bring a religiously informed, nuanced understanding of contemporary dynamics into the practice and theories of world politics. And so if we can leave behind the notion that separation is the defining feature of the contemporary world and instead explore the various formations of the religio-political world that we all inhabit, uh, then I think we're in a space that we can start to ask new questions and more adequately equip ourselves to address the challenges that we face in policy terms, whether it's the refugee crisis, the climate crisis, or the, the rise of ethno-nationalist movements who often also have recourse to religionized vocabularies. Good. You, you kind of made my job both easier, but also a bit more tricky. Um, let me insist on the myth of 1648, and not because mm -hmm. I totally agree with you sure. that that's not really, um, it's not helpful in a way, but in order to understand why people assume mm -hmm. that this dichotomy exists, we kind of still need mm -hmm. to kind of go back and say, what is it then that people claim happened? in 1648, or rather, what was that the starting point of that we now think is being ruined or made more complicated? Oh. What was mm -hmm. it then that people claimed about 1648 that makes them think that religion is on the resurgence rather than that it was there all the time? Yeah, so the I think you're referring um, to the very powerful myth of secularization in which the uh, gradually uh, the powers of public authority in particular with the rise of the modern state and the state system led to the transfer of political power away from the church and to the state. And there was uh, certainly there and there were many, many variations of how that power was transferred and what its implications were and the language that was used to describe it. Um, for example, laicization would have been a very common word from which we derive uh, now the French word laïc or secular and laïclik in Turkish. So you can sort of find the language, which are there, all these words are on the cover of my first book for a reason. You can find that language and then trace it back to these very interesting historical shifts in power arrangements and where authority was vested. And we did definitely see major shifts, sociological, political, uh, shifts in how power was distributed and how uh, public authorities were organized. Now, the idea of secularization is a whole graduate seminar on its own. Um, and of course, to talk about secularization would require another, you know, an, it would, you would all be asleep by the time, those of you in Europe, by the time we finished. But let me just say that the understanding that emerged is that there was such a possibility of uh, emancipating oneself from the religious, of somehow moving into a space that was non-religious and a-religious that would be cleansed of religious forces. And coming from where Europe was coming from, it is very understandable why there would be a variety of uh, people and communities and individuals who would call for this kind of emancipation, who would say, we really don't want the church in charge anymore. And, you know, I'm American and our revolution was fought against the King of England and the Church of England. And our notion of disestablishment was created and literally based around opposition to the Church of England. So all of those dynamics are at play here when we're talking about a society in which uh, the role of the church is being challenged profoundly and deeply and by a variety of different forces. So obviously the Protestant Reformation <laughs> a number of forces coming from within the church who are then challenging it in profound ways. The counter-reformation, the, the revolutions that I just mm -hmm. referred to, French, American, and so on. So we're looking at a whole host of forces in which there was an impetus and an urge to free oneself from the church. And out of that, and out of those series of historical and uh, changes that emerged from those, from those uh, impulses and those shifts in the power arrangements, we definitely saw a recourse to the language of the secular, which was to refer to worldliness or the world as opposed to the, the above or the beyond. So we saw these dichotomies evolving between secular and sacred or sacred and profane. 
between church and state, between religion and politics. And they took hold in very profound ways and in turn began to shape political, legal, and social realities in their own terms. And that is something that we've lived with, that we live with now, and that we are constantly reckoning with and grappling with. So as individuals, we have been socialized into the secular, into thinking that there is this space that can be uh, accessed, which is neutral, which is free of religion, which is open to minorities, which is uh, perhaps a space of free speech and free expression and can then be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that that space is of course much more complex than its own self representation would allow. So it is a mythological space. I think as humans, we are always, we are never neutral. We are never perfectly free. We're always encumbered in various ways by our habits, customs, institutions, histories. And so to try to decenter that story that there is this neutral space that has once and for all been achieved and that we can all just rest on our laurels now and enjoy it or spread it to the rest of the world with this sort of civilizational mission either of those alternatives are the ones that I'm trying to challenge in my work and saying, let's offer a different story. Let's take that story, understand it well, come to terms with it, grapple with that history, and then think about new ways to live together and to understand the world around us. Very good. So I mean, in a, in a simplified way, people talk about the US as freedom of religion and in Europe, a tendency towards freedom from religion because of these historical experiences. But the other aspect that you're also pointing to, and I think we will be coming back to that, is self-representation and self-perception. That is how one narrates this historical experience, and more importantly, perhaps makes it into a new normal. A normal then that institutionally needs to be spread and, and was to some degree spread because of the mm -hmm. imperial age, but more importantly, perhaps for us, is now a cornerstone of how international politics are conceptualized, because the conceptualization mm -hmm. is based on that this is not only normal from a European historical experience, but it is a universal normal uh, that, in a sense, everyone should self-evidently accept as the mm -hmm. best way of, of conducting in interstate relations as it were, but also perhaps between societies as well. But so let's park that for a moment because I think it's a very important discussion because in a sense, what we are talking about often when we talk about other countries is we're actually telling a story about our own countries. We're talking about our society by painting someone else's society in a certain way. And nowhere, of course, does that become as clear as in when you're actually trying diplomatically to interact with someone from another country, another society. So Merethil, let let's bring in the actual practice of how do people who work with diplomacy, who in a sense increasingly over time gain experience of other countries, how do they conceptualize something as both evident perhaps, but also invisible as a country or a people or a society's religious dimension? Well, thank you, uh, Ruspe, for this question. And, and let me start by uh, thanking you for inviting me to take part in this uh, conversation. I think it, it underscores how important it is that policymakers uh, take time out and uh, engage with, uh, with good scholars like uh, Professor Shackman Hurd and yourself. Um, now, in, in my reality, we, um, we uh, operate with sometimes notions that would seem very, very simplistic and banal because they're not, they're often not uh, brought out consciously until we, we, we stop up and in these various capacity raising or uh, 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 training moments, ask ourselves, so what do we mean by we have a secular agenda? We project policy objectives that have no color, no creed. How do we do that in a world where whether we like it or not, religion is one of the, 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 the factors that matter. And, uh, and there, I, I would say um, that uh, the first things that come to mind in, in, in my work is how the very understanding of religion is very, very flawed. Um, most of the people who come to the kind of trainings that we organize or, or um, when we are starting to discuss various policy policy, 
uh, challenges um, could pertain to whether we continue negotiating with country X, though they have introduced a Sharia-based penal code, et cetera, et cetera. Just the very notion of, of how that sits with us is, is often very foreign and very often just reduced to, oh, what do the religious leaders say? Who should we call? And, and as, as we start um, unpacking this among ourselves in a, in a, in a safe space, it's, it becomes very clear that we have to go back and, and, and start with ourselves very often and understand that um, the, the, the mindset, uh, the whole issue of understanding how our own blind spots, um, be they secular, I use the word though I no longer mean, know what it means, or Christian, uh, are actually sometimes staying right in the way of us getting to a, a, a more proper diagnosis of what it is we try to uh, relate to. And this is where I think it's so important to hear um, what, uh, what Elizabeth said about the political aspects of religion, that religion is not a, it's not a static. It's, it's, it's something that needs to be seen in context. We are not particularly interested in institutionalized religion. We are more interested in people in lived religion, what motivates them, religion as a uh, identity marker, as a worldview. And that's where our own identity and worldview world come in. And, and, and we have seen it time and time again. We run these trainings very, very frequently. They sell out uh, tremendously fast. And people come in with these very set ideas from day one. And day two, you can tell that there's this discomfort, like, well, I thought, and you know, mm -hmm. We, we are kind of a French organization, so why isn't it like? And, and, and that's where it's, it's very important to be able to provide um, uh, good uh, and sound advice and, and, and help people to navigate um, this landscape, which is, doesn't start at our borders, it starts at home. You know, what is it that defines us and how do we understand uh, for instance, how we project freedom of religion and belief. Is that a neutral way or do we use a kind of vocabulary that's unique to us? Um, not that I want to in any way or form try to, you know, um, uh, relativize its importance, though I think, Ruspe, you put your finger on something very, very clear that if the, the freedom from or freedom off is, is, is a fundamental uh, tension in between the US and, and the EU uh, approach to these things. So I think in short, um, we've had to uh, expand our toolbox uh, on how we as diplomats deal with this. It's not just a nice to know, something you read about when you have nothing better to do, but something that actually makes you a better diplomat if you, with the right mindset and skill set, are able to unpack the, the reality that you have to deal with. And um, I can, I can say a little bit more later, but I think what is important is also to, to really make sure that sometimes it's important to factor in religion, but also sometimes it's very important to keep it out. And that's where, you know, the whole notion of right sizing that it is, religion is important, but there are also other factors. And how do we know when it comes also served to us by external uh, influence as to, you know, um, the sort of geopolitical uh, soft power of, 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 of religion. Thank you. I mean, I think that's uh, the, especially the last thing, just to, to um, add something to that. It seems to me that sometimes there's this seesaw. Either religion is considered to be utterly irrelevant, and then when the religion is, so to speak, discovered, then suddenly it's supposed to encompass and answer all the questions which creates a very strange binary uh, that, you know, we wouldn't, we would probably not apply that kind of schemata to any other phenomenon in society, uh, that it's either of no relevance or it means everything, uh, which to me indicates that there is a certain lack of uh, uh, skill, so to speak, in order to be able to understand the proportions. I mean, what is, what is a reasonable proportion for this variable in understanding the equation? But I just wanted to ask you something else uh, with regard to that. From your experience, would you say that there is a difference between um, officials and diplomats coming from different parts of Europe? Because, of course, when we look at European societies, religion means very different things within those societies. I mean, the French understanding of religion, the German, not to speak of the Scandinavian countries that are often considered to be very, very secular in every sense of the word. Uh, 
compared to Italy, for instance? Or is it more or less, has Europe harmonized on this particular issue? That's a very good uh, question, Ruspe, and I think it, it is one that, that we, uh, we often have to um, make sure that we don't just paint too much with a broad brush. As I think seen from, from far, far outside, we probably look like a sort of kind of amorphous same. But once you start opening what's in the box, there is a lot of difference, even among the Nordic countries. You know, I'm Danish, you're Swedish. Denmark has uh, no separation between church and state. And Norway uh, introduced a separation between, no, between church and state. Um, and I, I think there it's, 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 it's very uh, interesting to, to, um, to take uh, advice from someone like Olivier Roy, who uh, I once asked because he said, you know, they can. I said, well, look at Denmark. And he said, it only can only happen in Denmark because they're also post-Christian. You know, they only go to church for, you know, Christmas mm. and funerals, or baptism comes first. Um, but, but, and, and, and on the other side, um, in those countries where there are uh, soi-disant strict separation is where people are generally stronger believers or belonging somehow, whether they are churchgoers may be another thing. So, so the, there, there's different levels in it. There's sort of the constitutional historic way of how you ended up in the category you did. And there, the French category is one that sets the tone very much for the debates that we have in Europe. And we have to be very honest about that. And sometimes it's very difficult to add nuance of, nuances of gray because we are just straight jacketed into la laïcité and it has to be like that. And I say that, especially working in a European Union institution. Um, but at the same time, there are also uh, quite clearly uh, uh, overtures um, and 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 this this goes a little bit to what the seesaw you said from from this you know it's not relevant and we shouldn't be looking at it. it's a waste of time you can do that in your weekend if you really have nothing better to do till to this rush you know now everything that the, the faith lens has to be applied full scale that is a little bit become a fashion um, in the beginning I saw a big difference between the European reflex of how to approach this much more low key, much more bottom up. We realized there were some issues we couldn't get our heads around. So we did what we do in the European Union when we are sort of create small groups so we can share best practices and exchanges. And that's what we did for from the mid 2000s to the mid 2010. And then things started changing in the US. So we opened up to the US to the, the, the or the transatlantic um, with, with, with US, but also Canada but where the approach was very, very different, where it was very much a sort of top down, you know, institutional, here's the answer, you just need to copy paste us. And where we are today is that there is sort of a sense on the European side, I, I, I feel that um, this kind of fashion, this kind of just do like the Americans is, is we, we, we've been through a couple of rough years with, um, the U.S. also on the on the whole overall issue of religion and, and foreign politics and how um, how a White House that clearly has uh, been very partisan uh, has 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 put its allies uh, in a different uh, in a difficult spot. So I think there's differences to how we've done it. I think also our reflex is more cooperative. We're not so interested in long winded explanations why this, that and the other. But what is it we are going to do about it? But I say that um, without wanting to sound as if I denigrate um, the good work we've done within the transatlantic uh, policy network and where precisely because we realize that we need more academic uh, injection into our thinking because we all read too little and many people you know who study they we, in some cases we overlap you know they they understand our reality and we see what we understand what they say basically so the academic advisory uh, board that we have set up has helped us to understand hang on a minute if there is this um, a schism in the Orthodox Church, what should we be expecting? Or, you know, the Vatican policy, here's what you should be looking out for. Mm -hmm. Or the use of Islam in the policy I I I imagery, 
uh, imagination, sorry, um, what does that mean? And that, you know, so, so we have different, we've helped each other, because, but, but we fundamentally look at different directions, I find. Very good. I just want to remind the audience that you're, of course, welcome to ask questions. You can do that via the Facebook page, but also here in Zoom, and we'll try and pick them up as we go along. So now that we've gotten into the nitty gritty of it, uh, Elizabeth, the United States, um, how are we to disentangle what religion is institutionally, but perhaps more importantly, as a practice which has political ramifications in the United States? And how has that changed over time? Because, of course, it's not a static situation. Of course. Um, thank you. I just wanted to begin by saying how uh, how grateful I am for uh, the invitation to be here and to particularly be back in conversation with you, Merite, who I met years ago. And it's so refreshing to hear a diplomat and policymaker speak um, in such an informed and careful way about these debates around religion and public life. It is very difficult and challenging terrain. I spend most of my days trying to uh, you know, find my way through it myself. And so I just wanted to express my appreciation for the way that you have taken uh, such a nuanced approach to these topics and to Rusay for bringing us together um, in this conversation. I think it's really important to have these kinds of conversations that cross between academics and uh, policymakers and decision makers at all levels. Um, and perhaps no more important today to seg to your question. Um, it's never been more important than today because of the fact that the US is undergoing such a tumultuous time in our domestic politics, which cannot of course be separated from our foreign policy, uh, which I think should probably become, be very obvious to the audience in this webinar. Uh, but I would just say that um, in terms of thinking about the role of religion in the US, um, one of the most fruitful approaches that I've recently developed with my colleague Winifred Fowler Sullivan um, is to think about juxtaposing do the domestic and the international and trying to think about religion across that divide and via that divide. So how does considering the domestic international uh, inform and enrich our understanding of religion and politics? And so we've just published a volume called At Home and Abroad, The Politics of American Religion, which is looking very specifically at the history of the American project and thinking about it as a national project that of course has always been religious and had religious dimensions and religious aspects of its political formation, but trying to look at that from uh, kind of from an angle or from the side. And this is one of the things that I think that uh, is helpful um, and goes back a little bit, perhaps, to some of the points that Merita made. Um, you were mentioning the seesaw. Um, there's, there's such a seesaw. It's either everything is about religion or nothing's about religion. There's also a seesaw that it's domestic politics or it's foreign policy. There's another seesaw between it's good religion, which saves us and brings us together as humans and helps to inform our moral decision making and bad religion, which of course causes terrorism and violence and makes people act loony. So there are all these seesaws that we're on and you know, home and abroad, good religion, bad religion. Uh, you know, and I think part of the challenge is to try to bring the kind of nuance and balance that we heard reflected in Merite's comments. And we need to do the same when it comes to American politics right now. And when it comes to understanding religion in American politics, there is a, uh, at the very, in the present moment, there's a kind of hysteria and fear um, that I think uh, is fueled by some of the very same Jacobin sentiments that Merite identified as being powerful in the European Union, which is to say a fear of religion, that it's going to come and overtake the public sphere and that it's going to somehow destroy our uh, form of government. I think there are real things that could destroy <laughs> our form of government and our way of life, including most notably climate crisis. But I don't think that religion on its own is an adequate explanation, going back again to Merite's comments about blowing it all out of proportion. So I think in the American context right now, we need to think very carefully about what uh, kinds of challenges we actually face as a community. And yes, there are going to be religious dimensions to that. I'm writing a book on the American border right now. 
which um, the border is a site as it is in Europe, although it is a different border and there are different dynamics. Um, it is a site of intense affect and emotion and fear and hope. It is a site of religion. And it is a, a site of <clears throat> enormously interesting identity politics um, and politics around uh, community and solidarity and difference. And so I think we need to look at challenges like the border or like the climate crisis. And we need to then think very carefully about the religious dimensions of those crises, the actors who are involved, the recourse to the, you know, the kinds of uh, institutions that become involved in these. And we need to kind of ask a new set of questions about how we wanna to live together and um, kind of move past the culture wars framing in which it is, well, there are these evangelical bad guys that are trying to take over our country and really think broadly about where, so what, what do we wanna do next? Who do we want to represent this country? When we, do we want this sort of imperial religious freedom missionaries going out and telling everyone else how to be, which is what Merita has experienced in working with our religious freedom folks, some of whom do have very strong and adamant views and are not that interested in listening to others, or do we want to listen? And do we want to sit back and hear other stories and understand other histories and then bring our, under, our nuanced understanding of our own histories that Merita mentioned into conversation? with those other histories. So they're very different uh, ethos or affective kind of orientations here that are mm -hmm. at play. And I hate to uh, reduce the American project to either one or the other because it's always, it's always got both going on. Thank you. I mean, uh, and I have no problem with that, but, but let me then kind of uh, pick on that a bit. As you mentioned yourself, religion to some degree, I mean, first of all, uh, we are probably never going to be able, nor perhaps should we, find a definition of what religion is, as in what does it constitute? Mm -hmm. Because for some people it is to go to church. I mean, in the classical mm -hmm. sociological understanding of the secularization uh, thesis, it was to count how many went to church. And the fewer that went to church, that was an indication mm -hmm. of them not being religious. And that, of course, becomes problem, a problem if you're dealing with religions that doesn't have a church to go to. So mm -hmm. how are you outwardly going to be able to manifest the religion someone else can detect and therefore understand whether it's on the wane or whether it's growing? But exactly because it, to some degree, plays a part in people's identities, even if they don't necessarily consider themselves to be overtly religious, it means that the, the project has, if you will, or this conversation or the lack of it has an existential dimension, even beyond whether it's religious or not. It has an existential dimension because it's about who people tell themselves that they are. And then, of course, yeah. who they tell other people that they are. So my question to you would be in this in the American context. And I mean, we are going to get yeah. back to Europe as well, because it applies to everyone. It, it, there is no confinement geographically to these issues. Um, but in the American context, to what extent can you see that there is a, an opening towards narrating this self identity in a different way than this very laid out classical conventional and therefore very comforting. Uh, these are the evangelicals, this is what they want. And these are the others and this is what they want. I do see that opening. Um, I was quite surprised actually to see that opening uh, in our current administration. Um, if you go back and look uh, carefully at some of the inaugural events, because admittedly this administration is very young, right? They were inaugurated in late January of this year. So we've had only a couple months. But uh, if you go back and look at the kind of events that they planned um, in the spaces that have been held historically and traditionally for faith or religion, they brought in an astonishing diversity of people. And not only just, oh, we'll have some non-Christians and non-Jews, so we'll have our token Hindu and our token this and that, which I think is, is sort of the sort of 2.0 version of pluralism. They actually, I think we're reaching for something rather different where um, there were, for example, indigenous leaders who may or may not fit a sort of religious mm -hmm. category because as you know from my work, some of the most interesting and uh, stories that we can tell about religion and politics and history involve 
those who are on the margins, who are kind of not really considered religious, they're just spiritual, or they're just a weird old holdover culture, or they're just kind of strange and different, and they're not really religion. Those folks often have an important message for us and tell us something about ourselves as well, and our own dominant understandings of religion. So I actually am cautiously optimistic and hopeful that there are those kinds of spaces opening up um, in the US. I think that we uh, have a new interior secretary who's of indigenous origins, um, Secretary Hogland. And I think that there is really a lot of new space um, for creating a different kind of sensibility, a different ethos, a different self understanding, as you were saying, Rista, in terms of American identity, in terms of, uh, you know, rethinking the centrality of uh, one's identity and how, whether or not it has to revolve around a particular you know, institutionalized uh, understanding of, you know, American evangelicalism. In order to be American, you need to be Christian. In order to be American, you need to be white. I think that those taken for granted kinds of connections that are often made without thinking or have been in the past are being interrogated now and challenged in a new way. And I can't let the moment pass without mentioning my, uh, hometown of Minneapolis, um, George Floyd was killed about one mile from where I grew up and his trial is ongoing right now. Mm -hmm. And it is being streamed live online. And it is a, just a very intense moment um, for all Americans. But I think I probably had more to learn than many of my African-American neighbors, my black neighbors, because I didn't even realize how bad it was growing up um, because I was not subject to the level of discrimination and racism. I think this is a moment where we're kind of opening up the box and looking inside in this country. It's not always pretty what we find, but the, the, the religious aspect of that is very real and is very much at play um, without turning it into the whole story. I think that there's gonna be a really interesting moment here for those uh, who study American religion. Excellent. Um, there is a question uh, which has been posed by uh, one of one someone in the audience. I'd like to use that question, and I'm going to turn to you, Merit, in a moment. But I'll start with Elizabeth since we're talking about the U.S. <clears throat> as both of you have mentioned, in a sense, people tend to think of religion as something separate from everything else, and in a sense, our conversation is about normalizing religion, not in a normative sense, but in the sense that it's sociologically not an alien part of society and, and has to be you know, acknowledged and, and analyzed like everything else. But that begs several corollary questions, if you will. And one of them, of course, and this in a sense cuts to the heart of the matter, because we live in the times that we do, can religion be instrumentalized? And who then determines what is an instrumentalization of religion. And the question, of course, is to what purpose? And who, can, who, who has the authority, so to speak? Who, who has the, the position to be able to say, this is not real religion, this is an instrumentalization? I think we all have an answer to that. So it's, it's, I'm, it's not a rhetorical question, but it, I think we need to discuss that a bit because I think that is one of the most uh, common ways of indirectly claiming that religion is separate and so therefore it is easy to see when it's instrumentalized so what does that mean Elizabeth. so in the united states we have disestablishment so we do not have a situation where anyone in any place or position can officially on behalf of the government or the legal system pronounce what is or is not real religion so that is kind of the paradox of disestablishment. At the, on the one hand, we're living with this, with this term, with this category, with this enormously vast and shifting set of practices, institutions into which it's, that it refers to and it's interwoven into the practices of sociality, into our laws, into our customs, our public holidays. The examples go on and on and on. Um, and so there, there, this is a tension that we have to live with. Um, there is not one person who can say that is religious and that has been instrumentalized. I don't think that there is, I don't think that there is that possibility. I would also want to ask our, uh, our questioner a little bit more about what they mean when they say instrumentalization, um, because 
I'm not, I'm not sure what exactly um, that means. I guess it's like using it for as this sort of part of the bad religion narrative where it's using religion to achieve some kind of worldly gain or some kind of material gain, or uh, I assume that that's what it's referring to. Um, and in that sense, again, going back to what you already said was that we're relying here on a very stable definition of religion that is transcultural and transhistorical and assuming that we can take that definition and then say someone is doing this with it or they're, they're, they're twisting it or they're turning it in a nefarious way in order to achieve some sort of uh, worldly gain um, or personal gain. Uh, and I, I don't think that we have such a category. I think that when we want to talk about causation and human uh, in, in, in human in, a, in the context of uh, social interactions and political interactions, we have to tell a more complex causal story. We cannot go back to the sort of religion made them do it story. So I would want to unpack the particular uh, accusation of instrumentalization and, and understand what is actually at stake in the actions that are being analyzed or criticized and then uh, you know, tell probably a much more nuanced story about the role of religion therein. And also troubling the notion, as I use the word myself, but at the same time, I'm always wanting to say, what are we talking about when we're talking about religion? Good. I mean, I think uh, one way of looking at it, especially considering our topic today, would be how is religion used in foreign policy uh, as an actual instrument, a literal instrument, uh, at it doesn't impute that it has to be less religious, but it still means that religion plays a kind of a very clear and overt role in how you conduct foreign policy, rather than informing generally your, you know, your worldview, so to speak. But we can get back to that. I just want to bring in Merita here on this. I mean, uh, Elizabeth has, has told us very eloquently about how one way of trying to get away from these uh, this kind of uh, groundhog day, this is what it is, and it's going to remain the same no matter which day we wake up on, uh, is to try and unpack the whole idea uh, that these are stable identity markers that everyone has to cling on to, and, and that the, there are more nuances between and inside them uh, than people tend to think. Europe is obviously an equally complicated picture because it's not even a country. Uh, it's not even a federal Union uh, in the way the United States is. Uh, we'll see if it ever uh, goes that far. Uh, we're not going to uh, poke, uh, poke that particular uh, nest of horns here today. Um, but even in Europe, of course, we can say that there are different understandings of what role religion should play and whether it's helpful or not. Does those variations on the national level play a big role for the union as such? Does the union try and find a compromise between all of these different variations or are they kind of in a separate sphere? Excellent question and no easy answer. Um, but I think some of this, what Elizabeth said about the US, which is super interesting, also applies to the EU. I mean, the, 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 the shock waves that the killing of George Floyd sent to Europe and some among the European elite that is very either pale or male or pale and female had this kind of reaction that could never happen. This is the US gone rogue, et cetera, et cetera. We know we have our challenges. And when you talk about the border, you could talk about the migration flow in 2015 and the religious undertones that a number of countries took as to whether there was space at the hostel. And I think that's something which in a formal EU setting, you will rarely hear anyone wishing to race because it's a can of worms and it opens something that EU leaders are very uncomfortable about talking about. You must understand that when we do this work, it is very much at the mid-level to senior level, but when we get to the political level, we suffer from the same as in the US. The policy, the identity politics where religion is, 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 a, uh, is a tool, is a weapon, and it is weaponized, and it is instrumentalized, it is hijacked, uh, 
both inside but also outside. And we have um, a lot of partners who want to come to us and talk about interfaith. And they come from countries where, funnily enough, there's not a lot of religious diversity. And often they come accompanied by a state minister for religion. And, you know, we may be European, but we are not that dumb. We can see it coming. And that is a smokescreen. And that's something which we should not waste too much time on. We are polite people. So we keep an open door. We discuss, et cetera, et cetera. And we can always learn from talking. That's very important. But we should also be aware of when we are served something which is, is not uh, helpful for the way we want to try to project our interest. We work a lot with organizations who, who have a religious motivation to what they do, be it the Holy See or the OIC. And, and very often they take upon themselves, and I may be a little bit daring here, uh, to tell people who they are rather than let people tell who they are themselves. So bestow an identity on people. And we have that problem both in terms of um, the plight of Muslims in Europe and we have Muslim Europeans who are totally capable of speaking up for themselves. We don't need necessarily to have a, um, uh, a spokesperson from, from uh, the headquarters of, of, of the OIC or from Turkey, et cetera, et cetera. And that is where I think we are, there's a lot of um, more maturity and awareness of politely saying, we are happy to talk but let's, let's let those talk who have real um, uh, knowledge of the situation and who can offer solutions um, because very often um, on these issues, and I should maybe have started by that, the solution is not at the European level, it's at the local level, it's at the city level, it's the mayor's level. Once you start mm -hmm. going to the national level, these issues are very, very difficult to keep on, in, a, in a sort of, not contained because it need not be contained, but in a civilized discourse where you are looking to find solutions and not just scoring easy points. And I think um, I think that is why we we have a lot of of, of the same uh, uh, challenges. One of the things that I think we can be proud of on the European side is that we have. We've started to walk the talk a bit more and said, okay, we don't agree with this, but we agree with that. So how do we actually carry this out? And, 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 and earlier Elizabeth talked about the, how we need to live together and come beyond this very um, uh, uh, black and white uh, a way of saying, you know, we have some human rights here and we think they're essential and you should have them too. And of course, universal rights uh, are universal and, and we do stand and, and, and back them. But in order to better understand when it comes to religion and the power of inclusion, exclusion, et cetera, et cetera, we've actually set up an exchange uh, platforms like an Erasmus on religion and society where the point is that we want to get beyond the headlines in the international press where religion is a bad word. It's about polarizations, repression. It's, it's all the stuff that you know, makes people vote one way rather than the other. But take it down to a local context where you see religion in society, hence the name, um, um, the EU's Global Exchange on Religion and Society, where you see it among civ uh, social, uh, civil society, not as a special category to go to and say, hey, did you on your checklist check, you know, number 17, or, but, but really see what is the interplay and what on different issues, be it handling of migration, be it education, be it uh, shared citizenship and religious belonging, because I think that's one thing also where we have huge problems. We've seen with COVID how a state all of a sudden starts playing religious protection politics, say, I will look after mine and mine mean, you know, if you're Modi, you're Hindu, if you're this, you know, so, and, and, and where does that leave those with my, with who do not belong to, uh, to the majority and, 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 and a different religious belonging, where does that leave people who still believe in a shared citizenship and a state that is, if not, if not secular, and again, I use it without knowing what it means, but one where there's space for all, if it does become religious, determined action 
by the politicians, maybe more than the constitution in place, then we are starting to see a whole lot of problems that will make it very difficult for us to stand up to a human rights approach based approach on, on, on these, these challenges. I hope I answered your question, otherwise ping me back. No, I think that was that was uh, very, very helpful. And, and it gives us uh, several new threads to kind of uh, unspool. One of them is, of course, this this very important domestic issue of what is a, what constitutes a minority and what constitutes a majority in what sense? Because, you know, mm -hmm. neither of those categories are particularly stable. Um, the problem for those who end up in a minority status is, of course, that they are usually ascribed that status by someone else. So it's usually also an indication of their relative powerlessness to be called the minority from based on whatever criteria there might be. Um, but the other aspect of that is, of course, that this is about, again, narrating who we are. But then the question is how we project it outwards. So perhaps now would be a good time to also start talking about how do states who are, in a sense, configured out of their own historical experience of what they are and how they understand religion, how do they project this when they talk to others? And how do they understand or misunderstand other states? I know, Elizabeth, for instance, you, you've written uh, about the United States and Iran, for instance. Uh, and that is a particularly juicy example, in a sense, because uh, on paper, of course, one is a theocracy, Iran, and the other one is the epitome of separation of church and state. It's written in the constitution and so on. Uh, but again, on paper, but then when we look at it from a more practical sense, I mean, not in any way underplaying or downplaying the importance of, of constitutional uh, architecture and what that means in terms of rights or lack of rights. But when we look at the practice of how religion is practiced and what importance it can or cannot have for how politics are made, and then of course, how politics are made when you interact with other states who are religious in a different way or in a way that you assume is different. What happens then? Yes, well, as you're alluding to, Ruse, this is a very complex set of dynamics and it leads to a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. And I don't wanna put myself in the position of being able to simply say, I can come into the history of American Iranian relations and pronounce on what the truth is and how everything should have been done differently and better. Um, but I do think that there are certain, uh, as I wrote in my first book, uh, uh, in the chapter on the US and Iran, that there are certain ways of thinking about religion and politics and in particular, the uh, value placed uh, by Americans on their achievements in that domain and their purported freedom and their purported uh, success at disestablishment, which of course is a story that we tell ourselves that I have troubled in my more recent work. But nonetheless, it's an important story that's held dearly by many Americans and that has influenced our policymakers, including some of those who were in charge at the time of the Iranian revolution. And I think that one of the uh, effects that we see here in terms of uh, American uh, presuppositions about our own religious supremacy, if you wanna say that, is that there was a very quick condemnation of the Iranian revolution as an Islamic revolution. And Islamic here was taken in a pejorative sense as something that was somehow irrational, that was somehow uh, senseless and it was baseless, that it was politically uh, naive and it was damaging ultimately. And of course, we know now, we know from the history of the early 1980s that there was a lot of damage done there and that there, there, was, a, there was a lot of uh, violence. And I, I won't go into all of that here, but let me just set that there as a, as, a, as, a, as a note. But what I wanna say about the US response is that there was very little room among our decision makers we're thinking more broadly about this, the very complex dynamics of the revolutionary movement and the very diverse parties that came together and united at the moment to overthrow the Shah. And part of the reason that policymakers had these blind spots and blinders on was because of their uh, deep investment mm. in the notion that modernization and secularization were embodied in the Shah. 
who was a very close ally of the United States and our close ally, Israel as well, had been involved in all kinds of arms deals. Remember, this was a, all of the geopolitical geopolit alignments were shifted then so that we had, a, a, you know, we were lined up with Iran against Iraq. We were also supplying Iraq with weapons. It was a very complex scene, but the point being the Shah was seen as our man. He was our proxy ruler. He was holding back the Russians, right? And he was going to ensure American interests in the reason in the region. And so when the revolutionaries said, wait, we the people of Iran, many of us, not all of us, many of us are coming together from different places and different viewpoints. We're not all crazy or rational. We're coming together and we're going to say that we no longer want this person to govern us. Mm -hmm. That was considered to be, you know, unacceptable and was immediately, you know, the, 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 the tensions and the temperature started to rise between the US and Iran. And I think that had the American decision makers been able to step back from the assumptions of the secularization and modernization and the Shah's form of governance was the only answer to, for the Iranian people. If we had been able to see otherwise and see differently, there maybe would have been space for the US to engage with some, not all of the Iranian revolutionaries, but some of those individuals and groups and to would have been able to support a different path forward that would have been neither the, the, the horrific violence that we saw unfold in the night throughout the 1980s and indeed to some extent much longer than that into the present, nor would it have been the Shah and his uh, secular theocracy for lack of a better term. So the space between is what we lose when we wear these blinders as foreign mm. policy makers. We lose the many other options because we're so deeply invested in a particular uh, religio-secular outcome. We must secularize, we must modernize, we must Americanize. Well, that may not be the case. Yeah, so I mean, in a, in a sense, what we're talking about is a kind of a singularity that modernization entails secularization. And there is only in a sense, one particular configuration of modernity that is sound and stable and good. Uh, and again, it refers back to the understanding of ourselves uh, that we are in a sense projecting to them as what they should be striving for. Uh, and so there is a singular end goal. Uh, and in, in a sense, one could say that this kind of modernization theory is not unlike uh, uh, successive stories of revelation uh, to talk in, in religious terms where we are Very much so. moving towards a singular goal that everyone eventually will understand is the only reasonable way of, of doing business, as it were. But Merita, this comes very much to the fore when Islamist groups become part of the Arab Spring, for instance, which unlike the Iranian, or rather, let's put it like this, the Arab Spring comes after the Iranian revolution. So by then, people are slightly more cautious and jaded about what the, all of this could mean. But the, the Arab Spring also entails so much more of, if you will, uh, a social movements, no matter how spontaneous or organized, that we can follow live, so to speak. And therefore, people have a totally different sense of the immensity of the movements that are taking place. But how does one then, as a policymaker, and, and you were there, so to speak, uh, when all of this was taking place, how did the European Union grapple and, and get, its, you know, get its head around the fact that some of those groups were Islamists? And in the case of Egypt, for instance, uh, they ended up with democratically electing an Islamist. It's before the Arab Spring, we had a small group um, attract to group of faith-based political actors meeting policymakers because um, a couple of people had, I, I wouldn't say anyone foresaw anything because I think that would be wrong, but we were convened together with uh, key Islamists, but also key evangelicals from the US uh, and they met together um, and, and, uh, and a, a series of uh, quite senior um, 
policy folks where I was often the, the youngest and definitely the only woman. And, and, and that network and the interactions we had led to some interesting um, contacts being made, um, an understanding of what they, and here I'm talking more about the Islamists than the evangelicals, um, were aiming for and, 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 and being able to see, you know, it's political Islam is many things and nothing today. And, and it's very important that we, we, de, uh, we don't lump it together and make it into the big boogeyman because that is also a narrative that some of our partners want us to take and say, you know, here's good Islam, it's moderate, it stays in the mosque or at home and the rest, ooh la la, don't go there. <laughs> um, and, 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 and there, I think it was interesting as a policy person to see the affinity between the faith-based actors, including uh, the evangelicals. And I remember in a meeting in Tunisia, just after, um, after the uh, events in, uh, in, in Egypt, where we had some Salafi sitting down with an evangelical from Texas, um, who's a, a great friend and, 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 and one of the people who know that you have to, as an evangel evangelical pastor, to lead and not be led by your constituencies, Pastor Bob Roberts, um, sat down and, and, and some of the Salafi said, but I understand you're like an American Salafi. And I think Pastor Bob was hugely taken aback because he thought, oh, no, 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 that sounds like not me. But, <laughs> but, but so I think through that kind of uh, contacts, many of whom are today either in exile, in jail, or five feet under. But the contacts we got, even me as a, you know, the most, the youngest member of the group, was something that was helpful for my senior managers when it subsequently came to say, hang on a minute, we now have to negotiate an NGO law with the new Egyptian um, administration. Who do we speak to? And I, I say that just to underscore that even if it was short-lived and even if uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, has, there has been a, a setback, I think that political Islam and Islamists was not what was the point. The point was that we feel more comfortable with strong rulers and that we still prefer to yeah. not address issues of governance and anti-corruption uh, but that we think that there are sort of some people who have a magic key for keeping things under lock. And I say that, and I should probably say that's my own personal opinion, but I share it, so I'll say it, uh, uh, because I think it's a very short-lived um, approach. So Mubarak was our man until he wasn't our man. Morsi was halfway our man, but, you know, was he ever? And, and when it changed... I think the Europeans actually tried to hell out, hold out longer, but once things start to avalanche, it, it, it went the way it did. Um, and that's something we are paying the price for today. Um, this didn't start uh, with uh, the Arab uprisings. There was uh, Hamas and Algeria before that. And I think for a policymaker to be asking some truthful questions, maybe not broadcast on Swedish TV, but um, there has to be a, a sort of reckoning and say, are we, are we really aware of the kind of world we are feeding into? And I, I believe there was an American ambassador to, to Cairo who in the 50s said that many of the problems in the region stem from Egyptian prisons. Well, if he was right, then what we have seen over the last 10 years bode very badly for the future. And we have seen with ISIS uh, what has happened. And uh, we saw the demise of, of Syria, which was uh, had to do with whether you would allow protest groups. And, 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 and we should not forget that. And that led to trigger quickly trigger down effects that you could say change the political landscape in, 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 in Europe. UK and, and maybe in the US. So foreign policy also has an impact and our lack of taking difficult decisions. And we're always accused of doing too little too late. But if there's no learning from what has now been 
uh, a long, long record of committing the same mistakes, then, then we have a real problem. And I, I will maybe just end by saying that we, we hosted um, Mohammed Sultan uh, in Brussels after his release. And uh, he came and told us about what it had meant for him to be in a solitary confinement on, on hunger strike and his concern about the others, whether Islamist or not, because it's not a, a special destiny reserved to Islamists these days. And, 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 and one thing he, he said, you may not like the Islamist narrative, you know, whether you understand it or not, but if you stand up for your rights, you help people to, 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 to not bend their head. And he explained that in the prisons, there were ISIS recruiters who, who kept saying, forget it, you know, come with us, brother, you know, the West has turned out. And he, he said that one of the things that kept him from not bending was that he had heard that um, late uh, Senator, um, sorry, I now have a- John McCain? Yes, my hero, uh, had, had spoken up and said, you know, we will not forget, we will not. And that is the kind of thing, if our silent diplomacy which sometimes is needed, has no expiry date, and we never speak up, we will be, by complicity, guilty of by association. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, we have now been kind of uh, uh, going into the Middle East and discussing fundamentalism, which actually is a phrase or a, or a concept coined for Protestants in, in 19th century United States. Right. So it's an interesting the way these things travel around. Um, but there is this transnational that you mentioned before as well. There is this transnational um, phenomenon to these things, both the religious groups, religious revivals, and different kinds of readings of the scriptures, as it were, that then inform these different groups. Uh, but is there also a transnational um, phenomenon in terms of how the states behave. Would you say that we could say that more states today in general invoke religion or are, have it on their radar when they are conducting their business? Or is this still kind of an exception to a general rule that this basic narrative, the conventional 1648 narrative still holds strong? Tricky question. That's a difficult. It's a tricky question because it forces me to generalize about all states, which is hard to do. Um, my sense is that, and as I suggested in my last my last book, Beyond Religious Freedom, there is a dominant narrative that is uh, circulating internationally, particularly, but not only since 9/11. But I think it's been accentuated and exaggerated over the past two decades. And that is the good religion, bad religion narrative. So in, if you were to focus on that narrative and examine state discourse, um, particularly foreign policy uh, talk and uh, conferences and um, NGOs and sort of the entire, you know, global bureaucratic output around the topic of religion, I think you would see an uptick in discussions of religion for sure. And I think you would see a lot of concern about whether it is good or bad religion. So, um, you know, is it the kind of religion that needs to be reformed or needs to be tinkered with by the state? Um, and does there need to be intervention? Um, and that's the, the religious freedom agenda, right? Very explicitly on the Americans was to go out and make sure that others were, uh, you know, that the bad religion was held in check or is it uh, the good kind of religion that needs to be kind of coddled by the state and encouraged and perhaps even funded? And that narrative, rather than the separationist kind of rigid Jacobin draw the line and never the twain shall touch, this new narrative where it's good or it's bad, and either way the government is going to have a role or the international organization or the NGO or the uh, foundation or whoever is the actor in, who's involved in foreign policy because foreign policy is not just the state, as we know, there are lots of folks involved. Um, whoever that is, we, I think we would see the uh, dominance of this uh, good versus bad religion framework. 
Um, now, Merite has not succumbed to that temptation in her words, and so I don't want, I want to make sure to be clear about that, that it is not everyone and that there are a lot of people who are informing themselves about the complexities of this topic and then reflecting that, um, that work that they've done in their uh, diplomacy work. So it's not everyone, but I would say in response to your question that there is this, this is probably the most dominant narrative that we see now. And yes, it is very much specifically focused on uh, majority Muslim countries, not surprisingly. Um, and it is often, uh, you know, deeply problematic. Going back to just underline what Merite was saying, I agree fully with her comments about the Egyptian uh, situation in particular it brought to mind for me a debate that I participated in in London um, several years ago uh, which was allegedly about for and against the promotion of religious freedom and my opponent um, expressed uh, her gratitude that she had been able to enjoy tea with General Sisi very recently um, and discuss freedom of religion with with Sisi and to me, this was just such a slap in the face of uh, my friends and colleagues and uh, that I had met and had encountered in Egypt and who had been uh, imprisoned and harassed by the authorities. Um, so uh, human rights lobbyists, journalists, academics, all of whom who were genuinely uh, speaking out in the interest of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right to publish uh, truthful information about the activities of the Egyptian government, all of whom were being uh, seriously harassed, if not imprisoned or subject to violence on the part of uh, Sisi's and his authorities. So to me, this idea, you know, having tea with Sisi to discuss freedom is, is, is an elitist discourse that, is, mm -hmm. that uh, detracts significantly from uh, the soft power of uh, the Europeans or the Americans when it comes to uh, the politics of the Middle East. Thank you. Um, so perhaps then what you are saying, if I'm not overinterpreting it, is that we are moving from a discourse that is kind of artificial in the way it, it bifurcates and creates this dichotomy into a discourse where the state feels threatened by some religious uh, uh, Exp uh, expressions and therefore needs to take invest more of itself into how religion is expressed institutionally and otherwise. So in a sense, it is perhaps the awakening of the state to the relevance of religion, but it is not necessarily the state understanding religion as a nuanced phenomenon it has to live with. It's more a question of control. Very well put. Thank you. Um, we have roughly two minutes left. So um, before I give you both the final word, very short interventions, I just want to say that this is also something we are going to discuss in the next installment, when we're going to discuss India and Russia, and how human rights as a language and as a movement, if you will, interacts with religion, whether people are, are justifying human rights with religion or denying certain human rights conventions on the basis of their religious faith. But finally then, um, I'll start with you, Merita, very, very briefly. What would, you, what would be your wish, so to speak? What would you like to see uh, in the next couple of years in terms of how not only the EAS, but in general, we work with religion as a phenomenon, not literally work with him, but you know what I mean. Uh, very shortly, I... Um... I think this field would be helped by being depoliticized, by taking out some forces that are maneuvering the very states and governments that you are talking about. Um, and I'm talking here about transnational, religious and socially very conservative uh, forces. And, and they are not just Christian, they can also be otherwise. Uh, that 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 make it very difficult for us to uh, to keep a, a straight cap. Um, I think that would be uh, the first thing. And then I think don't over exaggerate the role of religion. Uh, normalize it as we talked about. See it in context. Um, see it in your midst. Uh, that's one of the things that I like about our, our project of uh, global exchange on religious societies. We're also going to look at how this pans out in Europe and in the US. 
in addition to South Africa, Indonesia, and elsewhere. And, and, and then finally say that human rights are also many things. One of the things that we have kept saying for the last four years is that there is a reason why we call it freedom of religion or belief and that we see it as an embedded right. It's not a standalone right. It's a right that is not first or last in the hierarchy of human rights. And I hear Blinken yesterday came out and disavowed the uh, Commission on Inalienable Rights saying there is no such, uh, no right trumps the other. And that has been the problem we've had for the last four years. There's been a lot of trumping. Thank you very much. Sorry, the um, Elizabeth, unless you want to add something, I would say that's actually a very good final word. Absolutely. Amen. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you both of you uh, for this very illuminating conversation. And I hope that we can do it again at some point in the future. Thank you. With pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.